I am Brandon Yarns, and I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. And so um, I work at the VA hospital, the Veterans Hospital in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so my work is exclusively with psychiatric care um, and mental health care for older U.S. military veterans. Right, right. And um, I'm currently um, working primarily actually in research in um, an ISTDP related treatment called emotional awareness and expression therapy, EAET, that we're studying in a large clinical trial for veterans with chronic pain. And that takes up the, the majority of my time. I'm also in a geriatric psychiatry clinic um, every week where I supervise trainees and we do care for people with dementia and older adults with a range of mental health um, diagnoses like depression, anxiety, PTSD. Mm, amazing. Yeah. yeah. I'm so excited to speak with you. Thank you for your time. Um, there, there are so many aspects to what you do that I find um, very, very interesting. I'm really impressed by your your research. You seem from at least from my point of view, you seem to be quite focused in what you're doing on your on your in your sort of research trajectory. Um, and even as I looked over sort of um, your papers, I can see the very clear thread and the progression and the building. And um, I just think that's less and less common these days. So I really, I, I really like that. Is there some way you're tr ultimately heading with that? Is there like what's the what's what are you really interested in from a research perspective? Sure. So I um, I was exposed to ISTDP. I am guessing your listeners know what that is, intensive yes. short-term dynamic psychotherapy. And so I, when I was in my psychiatry residency, and so I was at the University of New Mexico, and I was very fortunate because one of my attending psychiatrists was... Um, in a core training with Patricia Coughlin at that time. And so he was pumped up about ISTDP and sharing it with all of us who were in training with him. And he would do a demonstration um, sometimes with a patient live and let residents sit in. And so I got that experience one night we were in the psychiatric ER, myself and this attending and a woman came in who was distressed and she was suicidal. And he spoke with her for about 30, 45 minutes about her feelings and what brought her in and the conflict she had with her husband that led to her feeling poorly and coming into the ER. And once she got her feelings all worked out, she felt better and she was actually able to leave the emergency room that night and she was smiling and it was a complete reversal, complete turnaround from how she came in. And frankly, I had never seen anything like it at that point in my career. And I was like, I want to do that. Yeah. I want to learn how to do that yeah. and help people. I mean, that's why I got into medicine and psychiatry. Um, but when I got more into ISTDP, I found that there was not a lot of research on ISTDP and Alan Abbas has done some wonderful studies and published a lot, and Joel Town, his colleague, and others. Um, however, there had not been a, a very big volume of clinical trials. So I wanted to set out to do clinical trials in ISTDP, or at, IS, uh, the, at least the ideas, the concepts, the yep. techniques. And so Patricia actually introduced me to Howard Schubner, and he's a physician that also been working with Alan Abbas and another psychologist named Mark Lumley and had developed this kind of manualized ISTDP that was time limited. Um, they had um, called it EAET and were undertaking an R01 funded large clinical trial with over 200 people in it at the time. And so I met with him, I met with Mark Lumley, and I decided, wow, this is the pathway mm -hmm. to where we can get federal research funding and get uh, a lot of uh, the clinical trials done that I wanted to do that would support 
the the concepts and the evidence and the the truths that I believe are in ISTDP. Um, so I kind of switched and I really got interested because it was focused on chronic pain more and more in studying chronic pain. Um, but the um, this is a long answer to your question, but the, the answer is that's been my trajectory of trying to really work on this evidence-based base for ISTDP and um, test the ideas and the concepts primarily through this EAET format um, to try to get that out and, and um, um, understood as a, a strongly supported treatment that's the kind of research studies that are often needed to put things in guidelines and to get um, people to accept it in the wider scientific community mm. beyond just the videos, which mm -hmm. obviously are highly persuasive to people who attend conferences and see them, but yeah. not as much to um, other parts of the mental health community, like the research and policymakers and these sorts of people. Yeah, so that's such important work. And I, th I think too, um, what I hear you talking about there is um, really building an evidence base, not just around um, ISTDP per se, as in individual sessions with an ISTDP practitioner, but the principles. Um, and I think that might even be more powerful than to just look at, you know, an ISTDP individual therapy to get some really rigorous evidence around the, the principles that underpin it, because then we can take those principles and apply them possibly more flexibly based on the needs of uh, the population or, or the sure. context. Um, and and it is it is lacking. Um, but I also really admire you for doing that because, um, I mean, I know from experience, these trials are they are a lot of work and they are a lot of work and there's all sorts of things that can go wrong along the way that you can't anticipate and it's often hours and hours of work um without knowing if you're even a going to get the funding if it's gonna if it you know like just the not knowing it could all amount to nothing um and so yeah it's, it's really hard work do you do you also so you're mostly doing research do, do you work in a clinical capacity as well currently uh, yes, I see some patients um, that are really part of, sometimes part of the study and yeah. sometimes um, outside of the study that I'm referred patients from the Jerry Psych Clinic. Okay. So I do a fair amount of, of ISTDP or EAT, um, and it's it's mostly, most of my time is focused on the research aspects of the study because of what you said, like to do a full-blown clinical trial that'll get published in a nice journal and will be rigorous and, and respected research, it's a huge amount of time. It's not something that you can just kind of do on the side. No, no, it's it's many, many hours and years um, yes. and, and desperately needed with ISTDP. So um, I'm so thankful people like you are out there doing it. Uh, but I, I wanted to just pick up on what you said because it is it is very important to me I don't really care what we call it. I mean, there are so many acronyms and Mark Lumley has a thing that he says about, you know, he has a PowerPoint slide with all the different three letter <laughs> acronyms of different kinds of therapy. And I mean, we're kind of doing that in the experiential dynamic therapy world, which is its own now EDT, a new, new acronym. And, that, and so, yeah, I've always been more interested in the fundamental processes that result in symptoms and problems for people and that can be addressed to help them change, you know, the psychological factors, what's going on inside the, the person that are so important. So that's why I, it wasn't critically important to me in the studies to call what we were doing ISTDP because EAT is really based on the same principles and some of the techniques are different and there are aspects of it that are different, which we can get into. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's really those fundamental processes that I think are getting covered up in the mm -hmm. popular media, the popular psychology world um, and in our culture mm -hmm. by coping skills, deep breathing, you know, quick and easy and simple fixes. That's what people 
seem yeah. to be drawn to. And there's a lot of that coming out every week. And I've always been more interested in in fundamentally what's going on inside the person, the the ultimate causes, getting to the bottom of the problems that people have and and resolving those. And I think ISTDP and EAT provide a method for accessing those fundamental causes and helping people change and get past them. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um the the acronym the acronyms are just yeah way too many and and like you say yeah. the umbrella term for the acronyms now the umbrella acronym for the acronyms the right yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh so yeah so maybe we can we can talk a little then about um e a e t uh, versus ISTDP from from my understanding obviously um ISTDP is an individual therapy and and you sort of go right. until until you're finished um you know uh, we're talking with EAET more about a time limited group format, um, which I imagine may have more focus on quite direct psychoeducation as opposed it to, does. A, yeah, sometimes in a therapy room, it's a bit more experiential, um, even the psychoeducation piece, but whereas, yes. yeah, okay. Um, is that, can I, before we jump into the exact differences, is it, am I right in thinking that it's almost like ISTDP was the starting point here for, for, for the development of this. But then it was, well, how would we do this in a group? Like it, it was more adapted based on the idea that it would be run in a group, the idea that, you know, um, given the population, perhaps the funding, however, the needs of that population and what was trying to be addressed, that it would then need to be time limited. Was it also that we would want to study it? And so it would make sense to have it be that kind of format? Exactly, exactly. So yeah, so um, I think I think if you you not not you, but the viewer is on YouTube already, um, after you finish watching this video, there are many videos by Howard Schubner that you can watch that are very have many, many views. And he talks in some of those about the development of EAET. And it really was that both he and Mark had interest in chronic pain and how to treat it. And they attended a workshop that Alan Abbas was leading and saw some of the videos. And Howard Schubiner says uh, that he went up to Alan and said, um, can I do this work myself? I, he's an internal medicine physician. And Alan said, Howard, you can't not do this for your patients. They need it. And so Howard started learning everything he, he could about it. And then he and Mark put together this EAT protocol. And I think the the design was absolutely to, mm -hmm. to put together something that could be studied in a clinical trial. Because, um, you know, in many ways, I don't mean to bash CBT if I, if I seem to do that a minute ago when I was talking about coping skills. But because um, I think in many ways, CBT saved us from extinction. Yeah. because they, when we had biological treatments and medications coming out and, oh, you have to have clinical trials and people were doing clinical trials on drugs, they very rapidly adapted CBT to be manualized and time limited. And they could do a short-term clinical trial yes. of a psychological intervention rather than a medication mm. and build an evidence base that was acceptable in this new world that was not just psychoanalytic thinking in our field. And so, you know, I think they were brilliant in doing that and keeping psychotherapy alive. And so that's really what Mark and Howard were trying to do as well, was to try to take those ideas and put them into a, a format that could be tested in a short-term clinical trial that would now be familiar to grant reviewers who had been seeing a bunch of CBT studies that we would have a similar kind of manual and protocol. So it would really be something that people would, reviewers would be accepting of and funders would be accepting of um, that could be tested in a clinical trial and may, and they were successful at, at that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That was really fundamentally, I think what it's about. And so people may be asking, well, what, what are the criteria? I mean, it does need to be short number of sessions. It can't be, oh, well, this person needs two More. or three sessions and this person needs, you know, 
a year of therapy or two years of therapy. It needs to be a time limited thing that can be tested over a short, short period of time with follow up. Yep. And people who review grants are used to seeing detailed protocols, therapist instructions, mm -hmm. handouts for patients, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a very clear thing, not a, well, we'll come in and figure out what the problem is, you know, which is what we do in ISTDP. Yeah. And the grant reviewers are looking for it to be focused on a clinical condition that's mm -hmm. very important, that's high priority for those uh, funding agencies. Mm -hmm. So with Mark and Howard having that background in chronic pain, they decided to focus it in on that. Whereas as we know, that's only one of the conditions that ISTDP can address. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, there's so much in that um, that I want to speak to. The, um, the, the, yeah, they're putting everything into that very manualized protocol kind of form. Um, I think as well, yeah, obviously when it comes to, um, to funding and reviewers and, and people that are looking at the evidence, um, they're interested then in the fidelity, you know, you know, how, how right. they, part of the purpose, right. That you can compare it to something that's written down versus what's actually being done, um, which is wildly different in the in the individual therapy um, so that is obviously a key difference but again if that can lead to evidence that really supports the principles that underpin that individual form of therapy um, then it's invaluable it's invaluable uh, so so it's a group format it's time limited roughly like what kinds of times are we looking at just for people that are listening that might not have ever heard of EAET EA -E yeah, so um, yeah. so what what Mark put together was actually three different manuals, mm. and they all have studies that have have used them. One of them is one ninety minute session, and that's it. Wow. So it's one session all inclusive. Another one was three individual sessions, mm. which was evaluated in a study with irritable bowel patients, irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. And then, then he they put together the eight session group manual, small groups of six to eight people, okay. and that that was initially in a study of fibromyalgia. So the first iteration of that was focused on fibromyalgia, and then they did a rewrite of the manual that was for all chronic pain, more or less. Um, so fibromyalgia and other things like it could be back pain, neck pain. Um, all kinds of musculoskeletal chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in starting to work with Mark, I added an individual session. And I think it was Mark Lumley's idea and suggestion for me to do that. So I meet with all of the, the patients who will be in the group individually first. And we do really a, a, a bit of a trial therapy like we would be familiar with in ISTDP. Um, the only difference is patients have already signed up for the study, so we don't screen anybody out after the trial therapy, but we have a much better sense and of, uh, you know, where the patient is on the psychoneurotic spectrum, for instance, I'm thinking about that, and, um, you know, what are the problems in their lives that we, we, we can make a focus of the therapy. Um, so it's really, really useful, I think, to get a handle on what the individual patients are coming in with. And then we start the group. And then we we pretty much follow the eight session group manual okay. um, after that. Okay. Wow. Okay. I wasn't aware yeah. of the um of the version with the one 90 minute session. That's that's fascinating. Yes. I'm gonna look into that. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I do have some questions written down. So I just want to have a quick look. Uh Oh, the the group the group process itself. Um, thinking about the group format, um, I've run groups before, and there's obviously um, ways in which a group works that I find to be um, particularly useful. You know, I think some of that can be um, right. some group members might be more vocal than other group members, and so even if you know people are reticent to speak, actually seeing other people do it first or seeing other people engage in the process and watching that and then sort of exactly. start maybe relating that to their own experience and that can start to build um, build an alliance or build insight um, or buy-in into the premise at least, M more so than if you were trying to perhaps do that in an individual context and there may, there may just be more initial resistance. 
Um, so some of that I see as a benefit. And then obviously there are other the other thoughts I have around some of the challenges that might occur by trying to do, trying to work on the principles in a group format. Um, I wonder if you can just speak to that a little from your experience, if there's what you've found in terms of how the group format works here with emotional expression and people maybe linking together the idea that their emotions even play a role in this at all. Maybe that's, you know, for the first time they're coming across this idea in a group format, what, what's that like? Is it helpful? Is it a barrier? Is it both? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, yes, I can, I can definitely speak for the rest of our time on that. <laughs> I bet, <laughs> I bet. Yeah, because it, it is complicated because the group can be your best friend or your worst enemy mm. as, as, a, as a therapist. Um, so, yeah, I mean, first, uh, just one of my colleagues by STDP, I was telling them about a session and one of the individual sessions. And he said, oh, Brandon, you can't open up these patients unconscious and then not give them any follow up. Uh -huh. And I said, but they're going in the group. And so, ah, yeah. you know, the group is for, for those who may be skeptical, just as intense. Mm. It can be just as powerful um, sometimes more powerful than individual therapy and life-changing and people can go through the entire process in the group format. Mm -hmm. The way we do it is structure it so people have a longer period of time in the group. All the group sessions are 90 minutes and some of the studies they've been two hours so that people can have a substantial amount of time as individuals to go through like an entire sequence that we would think is an entire central dynamic sequence right. um, in the process of the group. And we really do that, giving individuals time to be kind of on the floor or, you know, have the floor. And, um, and then, do they have to do that, Brandon? Do, like, and they don't they have, have to. to. Yeah, okay. No. So yeah. basically the other thing about the individual session, this is a real insider um, yeah. uh, stuff is that I kind of think who's going to be ready and willing to go first in the group session. So the individual sessions give me an idea of who, so I can kind of encourage or an inv invite one person to go first if they're like ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like like you were saying, it can spread. Hopefully, if somebody demonstrates a piece of work then they, they get better right there in the session. They have a change and everybody else in the group sees it. Then hopefully they'll want to jump in next. Yeah. Um, now, if somebody goes and it doesn't go well, then everybody can be heading for the hills in the whole group. So, yeah. you know, which, which it's, it's, you know, sometimes happens. But the group members can also help each other immensely saying, encouraging, things and and um, facilitating we have sometimes like I remember in the last group that we did one patient had a huge unlocking and everybody in the group was unlocked at wow. that point. everybody was talking about their childhood my father this and my mother that oh, like wow. after that yeah I mean it was extraordinary wow. um, that it happened and it was really positive and beautiful I mean not not scary mm -hmm. to have that happen but we we can also have group members who are resistant coming in. And when we're working with chronic pain, we find, you know, a particular resistance that comes up a lot is patient says, oh, well, there's something physically wrong in, in my body. My doctor told me it was my L4, L5, and that's causing my pain, even though my pain is from headaches all the way down to my toes and an L4, yeah. L5 at one spinal level couldn't be causing all of that. You know, they come in with that, oh, my pain is real. You know, we have to deal with that. And what what do you say to that? Um, all of these kind of challenges with chronic pain. And so if somebody's really stuck on my pain is physical. I don't buy this mental thing. I don't buy this mind body thing that you're um, talking about, then that can be really disruptive. And mm -hmm. if, if a patient is sometimes jumping in on somebody else's work, uh, yeah. now we do virtual groups, people drop off the call, they come back on, their phone rings, it's a telemarketer right in the moment when somebody else is on the verge of crying, 
it's it's very complicated. So you have to have, yeah. I, I would say it's it's not for the faint of heart, like doing a group, mm -hmm. especially with the with this population I work with and virtually. Um, is you really have to be at the top of your game, paying attention, m watching what everybody's doing, you know, seeing, you know. But all, you've got all the elements not there. Good or not good and, and derailing and encouraging. And so, yeah, yeah there's a lot that goes into the, it. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say you've got all the elements there, don't you? You've got that it's online, yeah. which is its own kind of distracting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's a group format that you're trying to do something that most people there are resistant to. Yeah, you've got you've got it all. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, yeah, but overall, I think fundamentally, I've done like 22 groups now that I've led or supervised. And I would say, I think the group is better for yeah. what we do. Overall, I think it's better, mm. particularly with veterans and with chronic pain. Mm. So I think that if you have any concern about opening somebody up in an individual session and then throwing them in a group, I wouldn't be concerned about that. I think they get they in many ways the support they provide for each other and the encouragement and the scaffolding and the way that they can build on top of each other when it's going well it, it has the potential to be better because like in individual therapy like you said if somebody's got an impenetrable wall up and mm -hmm. at a certain point you know davin lou himself could not break through this wall then you've got nowhere to go yeah. But in the group, you can just move to another person, yes. right? And come back to that person later, right? Yes. And so it, it gives a lot of flexibility. But like I said, you have to be very attentive and pay very careful attention. Yeah. I also hear um, that it sounds like, um, I don't know what word you put to it, but it sounds like there's a lot of sort of faith and trust that you put in the group process itself. You know? I do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, just the having to almost let go and trust that process to some degree, even when it looks like it might be. Yeah, and then knowing when to jump in. Um, I imagine too it has that that group format would have quite a um, normalizing kind of effect. I don't know if that's maybe the right way of thinking about or a val but you know, for for people to be able, like you say, to see other people around them who have been experiencing similar things. Um, you know, I think that is what's different about the individual therapy room, you know, that that is sort of missing. Whereas um, I hear with the group, it's sort of embedded more in a community um, and, a, and a, yes. it has this community component to it that's so important because people go back out into the real world. Um, and I think for some people, when they come into a therapy room, it, it just seems like a very separate little microcosm that doesn't relate at all to the outside world. Right. There's something about the group format, especially if the people in the group um, you can relate to them in some manner. You've had some kind of shared experience that's similar. There's something really powerful about that community component that I think just for what for what it's worth, um, makes it easier to somehow translate or to to um feel like it's really relevant to real life, perhaps is one way of thinking about it. and relationships too, because there's obviously the relationship component. Um yes. I yeah. think that's that's that is largely true of any group about that sense of connection is really powerful, which in ISTDP, we try to have that sense of connection between therapist and patient, but with a wider community mm -hmm. in a group with peers, then that can be even stronger, like you're saying. But the other part of it is that it's like, oh, you wanted to murder your son too? <laughs> so it's right. ISTDP specific things mm. also having mm. a shared sense of wanting to you know having thoughts of you know slapping someone or choking yeah. them or something like that that once they see that in a peer they mm. say so, oh okay well yeah I can admit to that I've felt that way too right yeah. that I've had those impulses and so yes. that I think is really important that's specific to the EAT group beyond what people get in a group that's on mindfulness or or anything. And I think that's so important because it feels so stigmatizing the way anger and violence are treated in our society, that there's this whole thing about you can't talk about it. You know, it seems like our society is like, you know, you can't have those feelings of anger and you can't have thoughts of violence, whereas in ISTDP, we think obviously... Well, we do. You say you can't, but we do. I can't help and, it. It's hardwired. <laughs> what do we do with them, right? How do we work through them and process them? And 
deal with them and get the information that the feeling is trying to provide us so we can use it constructively. Mm. And I think the group really helps with that quite a bit so that they don't they don't just have to take my word for it in, in going down that road of facing their feelings and everything. They can see it in their peers. Yeah, beautiful. That That's a really nice concrete way of um, explaining what I was stumbling around trying to put into words. That, that is exactly the concrete example. Um, because, you know, for, in, in, a, in an individual therapy, the idea that, that you know, we might be presenting to to the patient that actually this is a natural impulse that that humans have, you know, is again, well, that's just one person sitting opposite me, you know, who I pay often to, you know, saying that to me. Whereas again, in that community context to just even to see it, to see other people talking about it, that, that they're your peers and not your therapist. I think that um, relationship difference is really important here. Um, and it speaks to also, I won't go too far down this because we'll go off track, but it does also speak to something else um, that I'm really aware of, just that the the, um, the problem in society at large around uh, the stigmatizing of emotions, particularly aggression and anger, um, the violent impulse, all these things. Um, I think even the idea that, a, that an emotion comes with an impulse, like even just our basic literacy of what an emotion is. Yeah components of it, that um, there are reasons for it to, you know, all of this um, seems, we seem miles away from getting that that right um, or clear. Right. And yet there is so much focus somehow on mm. mental health or all these other ways it's being spoken about. Um, and I, yes. I would really like to see that. I would really like to see that shift. I think that would be really important. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I think what you just said there is huge. Can I comment on that? Yeah, I, I realized, I, I'll admit, when I was introducing myself here, I was like, yeah, mental health. <laughs> you know, we get programmed to use that kind of PC language. Um, and, and it's interesting because I really think in our whole field, mm. that mental health care now, we don't have psychiatry, psychology anymore, but it's like, there's people that have no idea the difference between a thought and a behavior. No. Right. Or a fantasy, you know, a feeling on the one hand and something you do. No. So it's like you can feel angry and you can even have thoughts of what that anger would do if it came out. And that's actually healthy. And mm -hmm. that's that can be really important yes. for you to be aware of. Right. Yeah. And and it's totally different mm. from acting yeah, from on anger, yeah. violence and, and hurting people and um school shootings and all these things we're so scared of in our in our culture. Mm. And I really think it's actually related that we suppress any yeah. discussion of our of our anger and um the information we're getting from our anger which is really why we have anger in the first place, because it's an evolutionary reaction. And suppressing all that and shutting it down and not being able to have a conversation about it in our society, I think is leading to, you know, some people who already have pre-existing vulnerabilities and have, have been through a lot of uh, trauma in their lives to explode it out in a really terrible, violent way. Yeah, so. I I know I, I couldn't agree more. And there is something that's actually in a roundabout way, very sort of puritanical about the, the way, yes. yeah, we talk about all of these things currently and we, and at large. Um, and the idea that there are, yeah, that a good person and a bad person and that, you know, that, that that's related to the content of your thoughts and right. all these, right. all these ideas. Um, it's just so damaging, so damaging. Um, and you're right, the confusion, I, I spend so much time just around the confusion at the front end of yes. what are we even talking about. So even the idea of anger, mo I would say 85% of people I see, if I ask them like about anger, the only thing they associate that with is behavior. You know, the right. idea that there's actually a f even a feeling in the body is absent often. They can sort of locate it once we talk about it, but straight away they're talking about behaviors. Um, exactly. And they're usually talking about, um, yeah, acting out and sort of, you know, more like anxious discharge and, you know, that there's, so it's um, the idea that there could even be something useful and wise 
and vital about tuning into when we feel anger, that we could take that as a piece of information that might be telling us something important about what's going on and obviously right. find ways to then bring that into our behavior if we want to. Um, that concept is just missing, I find. Exactly. It's almost yeah. like we, should, we shouldn't feel anger ever and we should do everything we can to curate our, our inner landscape to ensure we don't feel it. Um, right. Right. And that is, like you say, then just us uh, trying to live in some imaginary um, repressed universe, um, and yeah. like you say, then yeah. leads to all these other all these other issues. Um, but yes, that's a wonderful aside. I could talk about that for hours too. I find that a, I find that a real challenge at the front end. So I'm wondering, oh. actually, it kind of does relate to to the chronic pain um, groups that you run. Um, how do you I'm really interested in just the different ways that people are able to help others bridge this gap, this sort of conceptual mind-body gap. And so something like chronic pain, I guess, is a really good example of that. Are there particular ways that you've found that you can talk about, sort of translate some of this into terms that is just more digestible, somehow is more acceptable, is able to be, yeah, better grasped and understood um, because I, I guess there's two populations I'm interested in. There's obviously, um, people living with chronic pain, um, and how we can help them. I'm also really interested because I've done a little bit of research, um, over the years looking at, um, psychiatry training pathways here in Australia, um, and workforce development, uh, with psychiatrists. And I'm really interested in how we go about sort of teaching health professionals, these ideas. Like also, like I'm thinking too about um, not psychiatrists, other kinds of doctors, um, where the where I mean I've I've interacted with so many of them, where the idea that you know anxiety, stress, depression, some of these things could actually be related to, that you know could be related to some of the physical things that we're seeing here. Oh um, gosh, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, or or <laughs> even or even you know chronic pain. Um, in my mind, it seems like some of that is so well established now um, right. in the evidence base, and yet it doesn't seem to be traveling through. But yeah, anything you have to say on that in general, um, I'd be really interested. The language that you use, the way that you go about helping to um, demystify this connection. Is it just that we need to just present some evidence and say, look, here's some papers. Um, what works for you? Um, no, I don't think so. I think, <laughs> yeah, I, don't um, think so. yeah I, I think it, like you said, it would have been well-established fact if that was all we had to do was present the evidence. Now, obviously I think it's important to have the evidence because that's what I said in the beginning, I'm trying to work on, um, with most of my, most of my day, mm. um, every day. And I, I think though, it's got to be a culture shift mm. ultimately that's going to bring it about. And I think uh, that's got to happen within the patients. And so yeah. I hope that every patient, you know, at least in my healthcare system, change comes when the, the veterans are speaking up, speaking out. So I hope they all, um, all the ones who benefit become ambassadors. And we have had like some veterans unprompted write thank you letters to the director of our medical center and that sort of thing. And I think that's hugely important. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us who've been patients and um, can advocate, I think should should be advocating for these kinds of changes and connections. And I know a lot of a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. um, but I I when I'm with the patient, how do I get them to start to open their mind to mind body connections? I don't usually list a lot of research studies. I My saying is um, what Patricia taught me, Frieda from Reichman quote, the patient is not looking for an explanation. They're looking for an experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I find that a lot of discussion about ruling out their L4, L5 that I mentioned earlier, or this, you know, EMG fine, or this and that and the other, can be helpful if all of those tests are negative. Yeah. But when when the test or the imaging study shows something, you are not going to be able to rule it out. Yeah. And so we focus on ruling in the mind-body connection. Mm. And that's that's where 
I do most of my work with the patients that I see and have seen. So it's like, let's try this, okay? I don't know what's causing your pain, right? I realize you have this finding on your X-ray or your MRI. I also know that there's a lot of research that that suggests those are not that important. The people without pain have the finding that you have. Yeah. So can we try looking at an example when you had stress, you had a conflict with somebody, process your emotions together, and let's see if it helps you. Let's see if it affects your pain, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then by doing this experiment together, then we'll know. We'll know what's causing your pain. Yeah. So somebody gets in and they say, oh, my pain's up. It was the weather. It's the barometric pressure. You know, I always say, let's see. Let's mm -hmm. see if, if that's what it is, right? Because I, I, I had this patient one time came in, a pain was 20 today. It was the middle of therapy. Your pain is 20. What? what? What happened? I have no idea. I don't know. We go through the session about halfway through. He said he got a two a, a phone call at 2 a.m. that a family member had died oh. last night. Oh. And it woke him up and he had to go and he had to deal with it and the thing. And, and it's like, gosh, sir, do you think this has a relationship here? So again, it's using examples, mm. specific examples from mm. the patient's life, mm. using specific yeah. experiences that yeah. we can facilitate in the session and then say, okay, you, you come to the conclusion about what do you think is the big reason for your pain? Do mm. you still think it's the L4, L5 disc bulge? Or do you think it's what we've been working on here? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I've seen in my population is the most powerful yes. thing. But there's still the rule out and the rule in approach, yeah. you know, and that's whatever works in those situations. I think they both can be applied mm. right, to help our patients understand their own experience. Yeah, that's lovely. But with, I don't know if you want to comment on that. <laughs> I'll just say briefly, but um, but feel free. Yeah, if you've got more to say, I would love to hear. This this is the part I find fascinating. Um, yes, I I definitely think whenever I have a question like this, the answer I almost always find is just to go experiential and focused yeah. on the individual yes. right, and kind of let that lead the way. Um, I really like though that you you start you started off that example with um you saying, look, I don't know what's causing your pain. Like starting from that position rather than coming in as the authority, um, right. you know, because then you obviously can step into all those sorts of shoes and then there's going to be resistance to you. And um, that's really nice. And I think it's also um, makes it a little bit more like a joint exploration, you know, like the two of you are kind of working together on something and you're willing to say you don't know something. I think that really matters to humanize um, what can otherwise feel like for many people, another expert kind of coming into. Yes. And especially if they've had a lot of um, a lot of history with the medical system and lots of yes. people, you know, lots of different experts telling them this and that and um, and validating them in all sorts of ways. I think that's important. Um, I, I, the only part I do also want to add into that is that sometimes too, um, I find it's useful to talk like for people that are adamant. It's it's definitely you know this this um, thing happening in my back. I often just talk about well say it is, say that's part of what's causing this, might it also be true that there are other components that we could work on? Like at least could we look at it as, well, even if, you know, 50% remains from that, but we could do something about another 50% of it that's contributing, sure. would that still be useful to you? You know, like kind of trying to take that approach can be, can be helpful too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When there's somebody that's really firmly attached to that MRI finding, I find that's the only way yeah. Um, that we can approach it, yeah. approach that person in that in that moment. I I completely agree with you. Yeah. I am always thinking in the back of my mind, we're gonna get the other fifty percent too. Right. Yeah. Gonna... yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> my goal. Like, we'll change you know, this by the end, but you know, we'll... yeah. <laughs> suddenly their pain's gonna be a zero, and it's gonna be, oh, how did we get here, sir? Yeah. Um, it's amazing. But yeah, but but this brings me to the what what you were saying. It brings me to the healthcare providers and uh, trainees and everything, because it, I think what you were summarizing there it highlights how different what we're doing is from mm -hmm. the traditional medical model mm -hmm. and what all of the chronic pain patients have experienced. You know, we've had patients come in. I've had twelve doctors and I've got twelve diagnoses. 
-hmm. And, you know, they come in, they do their thing. The doctor has the agency. Mm -hmm. The doctor listens their story, asks them questions. And then the doctor, comp you know, runs tests, does an exam. And then the doctor makes a diagnosis. Oh, Sir, this is your problem. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor has the agency prescribing a treatment, mm -hmm. right? And and all the patient has to do is passively accept the treatment, take it, and it should all be better. And that works great for an infectious disease, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it works perfectly. It does not work at all, in my opinion, for what we're doing, yeah. right? Where we have to have a collaborative alliance with the patient mm -hmm. to, to work together with them. Mm -hmm. They're the expert on them. I'm the expert on whatever I know about chronic pain and psychology, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to come together and work collaboratively. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a reach um, for many healthcare providers yeah. to, to shift into that mindset of actually the patient has as much agency or more agency because the change actually has to take place inside them. They actually have to do the yes. work here. Yes. Right. Is it, it's really difficult mm -hmm. um, to apply. And so, yeah, I think the patient's testimonials, the patient's going back after seeing you and getting better and telling their doctor what happened mm -hmm. and having it from the ground up, I think is equally as important, if not more important, again, the patient and more agency than we do mm -hmm. as doing the research, as yeah. showing what we're, you know, the approach we're applying is mm -hmm. effective in, in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. It's all, I think, important, but it really needs a culture shift, a paradigm shift mm -hmm. so that people are seeing, doctors are seeing how, yeah, I mean, chronic pain really is in that same constellation as depression, anxiety, PTSD, and is not over here in this other constellation of, you know, strep throat and, and <laughs> things like, uh, and, uh, you know, yeah. a heart attack that has a clear, like, biological yeah. focus, right? Yeah. That obviously those things are influenced by psychology yeah. and psychosocial circumstances but but I think you get what I'm saying that it's really you know phenomena that really should be mm. primary in what we're doing our bread and butter in addition to depression and anxiety mm -hmm. right and we've seen the rates of chronic pain go up in our society just the same as the rates of depression and anxiety right yeah. they run together we're always talking about how they're comorbid yeah. well what if they all had a unitary Contract. set of causes in a person, right? Mm -hmm. That it was all extension of the same fundamental mm -hmm. conflicts yes. that a person has inside and the defenses that they've been using that are worn out, right? Yes. I so I don't have a good answer on persuading people's, uh, persuading providers and helping them, I think getting them excited, showing them video, showing them the research. I, I The best I can come up with at this point is a multimodal approach. And I'm trying to make my contribution to that yeah. uh, with the research, but it, it really is a big focus for me. And so if you have any ideas, I mean, I don't know how you, you yeah. talk to people or, or get them to see um, yeah. what, what we're talking about here. I think, I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, I imagine, I imagine for doctors hearing firsthand from their patients and seeing firsthand from their patient that something shifted, something has changed for this person's experience in the world. Um, because, you know, the manner in which for many of these patients, um, they really do open up. Like it's like the, there really is quite a change in terms of, I call it like vitality. Um, yes. And, and like a, almost like a liberation and an ability to be in the world in a new way. I think that's, I think that's obvious to many people. Obviously yeah. see, seeing the change in the patient. Um, seeing the change in the patient. Yes. Very powerful. Yeah. Um, I think also at, at the start of that um, last um, piece that you were saying, you were talking about how, um, how it's such a shift from the medical model. And I, I agree. And it's also, I think, even within psychologists, 
such a shift from CBT, right? Just such a shift from <laughs> it really is telling the patient what to do. Yeah, yeah. And but it's it's also radical this idea that we would spend sort of so much time focused on emotions, uh, that in and of itself, that you wouldn't just sort of teach someone some new ways to think. Um, or you wouldn't, you know, um, that's also really different. There, there is something fundamentally different about um, if we call it EAET or ISTDP or just emotion focused um, work, there is something um, even amongst psychologists that is can be quite difficult when I'm talking to them about ISTDP as an approach um, can seem like I'm speaking a different language sometimes. Um, so I think even even within psychology, there's a real um, there's a real shift that would be useful if we could if we could kind of shift our understanding of these things in new ways. Um, which also circles me back to something you were saying earlier around CBT and, you know, that you're not demonizing CBT. And I feel the same way. I, I see I see that CBT has a really important place um, and it can be really useful for particular um, for particular people in particular circumstances. I still think it's a useful skill set to be across and to consider. Yeah. Um, but it really does treat emotions like they are things that we can easily manipulate. Um, or things that we should be um, trying to change because they're creating problems for us just for having the emotion. Um, right. Makes right. sense. Um, you know, you can come up with a new way to think about the situation, which will help you to not feel that way anymore. Right. Yes, right. That, I would say that's a common, <laughs> yeah. common word. Yeah. And often yeah. even when I, I present the idea of... Um, like you were saying earlier about making links for people and sort of talking about, um, you know, if we could if we could work on um, experiencing and expressing some of those emotions here together. I often have, um, you know, patients that say to me, "Oh no, I do too much of that already." You know, I feel I feel miserable all the time, or um, yeah. you know, oh yes, yeah. self attack, yeah. or you know. So even the idea of what of that can be can be quite challenging, I think, um, at times. Um, so I don't know if you have any anything you want to say in regards to that, but I can. Um, I can Absolutely, I I just I I think that there's such a focus on behavior, there's such a focus on what to do, yes. and and the, the role of the mental health care provider is to tell the patient what to do. Well, you can do this, and you can try this, and you can try that, mm -hmm. instead of a focus on working together to get to the bottom of your problems. Like that seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like that's mostly gone away. Yeah. And there's a lot of psychology that seems to have been taken out of psychology and replaced by, you know, behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I hear, you know, C a CBT for insomnia, very effective. You know, works extremely well, but it's really about sleep restriction, stop taking naps, you know, to cut the caffeine, turn the TV off. It's all what to do, behavioral stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big piece. It's like, what if the patient doesn't want to do that? What if they are unmotivated to do that, right? What, what if they're about, in a situation where they can't do it today? You know, like what what if, something yeah. happens and they need to be flexible with this new routine, you know? Right, <laughs> right. That's a good one. Mm. And and so, but the, the internal barriers people face to not, not doing what they know they should be doing, yeah, that's where I think we're supposed to be coming in yeah. with psychotherapy, I agree. right? And, and not just, you can't just tell the patient, oh, do this. And then what if they don't, yeah. right? We have to deal with that, mm. right? And that's part of the process. That's mm. part of the psychotherapy is getting over those mm. those barriers and that resistance. So I think that's why I'm skeptical about education. Yeah. Frankly, yes. yeah. But about mental health and, and so forth, because it's like a lot of these things that people say, oh, go take a walk in nature and do, do I mean, people know this. Yeah. But they have a million reasons why they can't do it. They're not doing it. Mm -hmm. And getting over those mm -hmm. kinds of barriers, that's where psychotherapy comes in, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're supposed to be addressing. Mm -hmm. so. it's, it's also generic. 
like this advice giving just becomes generic and untethered to the individual sitting opposite you and and not just the individual right. but also whenever they're going to draw on that advice which might be the next day when they're feeling depressed um the particularities of what is going on for them in that moment it's untethered from that so if i tell someone every time you feel x you should do a breathing exercise um it doesn't take into account where or when they're going to be drawing on that advice and whether or not it's even relevant to that moment for them. Right. So I think what you're speaking to is that in a roundabout way, this has all become deeply disempowering, um, if we call it that. It's it's um people expect people accepting the premise that they can't possibly know what to do for themselves, right? Um, and that the the best way to address that is to seek out advice from others who will tell them what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And when it's not working, you can go back to that person and say, it's, you know, and, and you'll continue forever more, if you like, to go right. and speak to them every week and get your advice. Um, and sure, there's a place for that to some extent. You know, obviously there are skills deficits and there are, you know, and for people that have perhaps, you know, um, had a lot of neglect in childhood and lacked any kind of, you know, parental guidance. Oh. Or, sure, there's a place for it. But I think the the ultimate goal is not to stay in that phase. Um, it's it's that you hopefully come to a place where you're working with a person so that they learn about how to, they learn to better relate with themselves. And actually, hopefully, right. this idea of agency that you're talking about, this right. idea that um, challenges will continue to face me in my life I will continue to face challenges in my life um, and I can't predict what they will be at this moment but there's a, a better sense of confidence that I will be able to meet them when they do and not necessarily need to um, defer to someone else all the time about what am I supposed to do in this moment and I think that that way we relate to our internal um, landscape and the signals that our our body our brain is sending us that is that is the um the starting point of all of this you know absolutely. And, absolutely and so it's changing that it's very very difficult um but that to me is what's empowering whereas i think the word empowerment is often being used now as well someone didn't understand that when they get anxious um it's because they had experienced trauma and so now they need to I don't know, do some breathing exercise that's going to help their brain not see. Like, I don't know. I think it's this sort of advice giving and and very yeah. specific tools and skills um, that's seen as empowerment. But I see that as lacking depth in, in multiple right. ways. Um, and I think it's too generic. And it is taking it's away life. people they just see. It's the it medical is. model it is. Of, of just telling them what to do. And they're supposed to just do what you tell them to do. Whereas in my SDDP, we're often like, well, don't tell us, don't, yeah. don't do what I tell you to do. I mean, and, and, and the, in our tradition, like the psychodynamic tradition, advice giving is like a taboo. Like we're not, we're not supposed to give the patient advice. That's right? Right. I mean, we're supposed to help them because one of my patients said one time that he had a neighbor mm. um, who was like, I don't know why you're going to that psychiatrist and do what he tells you to do. And he said, I told her, he doesn't tell me what to do. He helps me figure out what I want to do. Oh, wow. And I thought that is the best mm -hmm. compliment mm -hmm. I have ever yes. gotten. Right. And that is exactly what my goal was. Yes. Working with the patient. Right. Exactly yes. what we're trying to do. And then there's so. a clear end point because then it's about getting someone to a point where they feel, oh, now I feel capable to be able to make these right. decisions for myself. Right. Um, right. As opposed to the advice giving model. And I guess the medical model, like there's just no end point. You just keep going back if it's not working and you go back and, um, and I think diagnoses is a whole other area that's exactly the same thing. You know, I, I see a lot of people, um, oh, this diagnosis, I don't know, like this diagnosis now might be more relevant to me and they really want to talk about a diagnosis. And then, you know, that might mean, uh, I don't know, this kind of this avoidance of doing the work by focusing on different diagnoses and, you know, which ones apply to me. And there's this whole yes. landscape there that we could go into. Um, 
huge problem. Yes. Huge, huge problem. Yeah. So, so the work you're doing, the research you're doing is so, so important in that regard. I think really, um, really building the evidence base around those, those key principles. Um, I actually um, like the acronym EAEP um, because at least it involves emotional awareness, emotional expression. Or what is it? At least it involves the word emotion. Yeah, uh, emotional awareness and emotion, uh, emotional awareness and expression therapy. Yes. yes. Um, so you know, as opposed to ISTDP, which um, I think for clinicians it might it might mean something. All those words put together somewhat, but I think for anyone else reading the the evidence doesn't really mean a lot. Um, there was a there was a particular study of yours I read that I wanted to ask you a question about. Oh, okay. Uh, where is it? Um, so this isn't this is um an older paper. So in two thousand and eighteen, you published a paper about adults living with uh, HIV, um, and you were looking at grit and ambition. Is that you? I got the. I right was paper. a co-author on that paper. Yeah, right. I did not right, lead right. lead that study. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, that one stood out for me because I really liked I, I like that construct um of grit. I'm wondering. I don't know. This is a bit of a wild card, but I'm wondering if you see any role for for that in terms of um, emotion focused work, because obviously, um, and I think I think there are papers of yours too where I where I saw this in the results section. Obviously, um, in in these group therapies, there are going to be people who have huge reductions in their pain, and then there are going to be people that don't change. Um, right. I'm, and I'm. I'm curious about what you think might be some of the um, the mediating, moderating factors there, like what why it works for some better than others. And I was wondering about this role of grit, um, if we call it that, um, because I think to face some of these face some of these ideas and take them on seriously and contend with them, and obviously to get in touch with emotions that we've spent our whole life avoiding, um, requires a certain amount of grit perhaps. I'm wondering if you see that as something that, that's relevant or you've thought about it or maybe you have studied it and I haven't seen it, but any thoughts? Uh, yes, I haven't I haven't studied grit in, in the chronic pain research that I've done, but I do agree with you. I think it's very important because it, in addition to the patients that get better and, and get to the end and they don't get much better, they're also the patients who attend one or two sessions and then don't mm -hmm. continue, right? Yeah. And what I always say to my, my staff here and the patients is there is only one way I know that I won't be able to help you at all. And that is you don't come back mm -hmm. because that will guarantee that there is no opportunity for, for me to help you. And so I think the patients who struggle with it and and they work on it and maybe they're very skeptical at first. And, you know, I did have a patient in one session on the first session. It was actually the first group I ever did. He it was in person around the table and he stood up um, when I did my spiel on chronic pain in the brain. And he said, I'm not buying it. And I was like, oh, God, no, maybe I better give up now. This is the wrong career. Um, but he ended up having grit and making it over the finish line. And he oh. he reduced his pain more than anyone else in that first group. Mm. Right. So I think it's just initial skepticism or initial diagnosis that somebody mm. may come in with, as you mentioned earlier, is not a very good predictor. Yeah. I had another woman that came in and said, I have nine autoimmune diseases. And I was like, oh my God, what, how am I going to help this woman? Nine autoimmune diseases. I, it turns out, I think the doctors were a little generous with their diagnosis giving again. This is what happens. Yeah. completely resolved yeah. all of those symptoms by the end of, of nine sessions. Yeah. And so I think the patient has to though, have their own agency, put their own investment into it, keep mm. coming back and, and working on it. Mm. So we did a, a very, we haven't published, but we did a very quick analysis of, of all bunch of different factors that predicted outcome. 
the only thing that was associated with pain reduction was attendance. Oh, wow. At the session. Wow. So we tested all sorts of psychological constructs that were measured by different questionnaires that the patients filled out on emotional approach coping and, and all sorts of things. Did, and you, none of them... Did you look at compassion? Do you remember if you looked at compassion? We're doing it in this oh, good. study. Hope we so. have not good. so far, good, good, good. but we are doing it. Okay. But yeah, attendance. So it's like just showing up and, and putting in the work is, mm -hmm. is the best predictor that we have of, of wow. getting getting something out of treatment so far. As you were talking too, I realized that I actually think um, you obviously have grit. Like I, like I think this what you, like what you're speaking to there, you. you know being able to have that happen in your group and actually not walk away and say, I'm never doing this again. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. That's so important. I mean, for a therapist, but also someone who runs groups. Um, yes. to be able to just be with that unknown and go with it. Um, and confront everything that's happening inside you as well, right? So um, that's important. There's something too, though, about him standing up and saying that so assertively. That, assertively. Uh, yeah, I know on the one hand, obviously can be a kind of, it could be a kind of defiance or resistance, but, you know, maybe that's also partially him being honest to what he's experiencing in that moment and willing right. to say it. Like maybe that is yeah. kind of, well, I'm here. I'll tell you what's happening for me right now. It, it's his way of trying to be as forthright and transparent about what's going on that's available to him at that moment. I think so. Yeah. Um, and so maybe that is part of what then, maybe that indicates part of perhaps why why he um, was able to engage in the process and have significant change. Uh, the unconscious component I'm, I'm curious about um, because I, when I, when I, yeah, when I'm talking with people about emotions and there's obviously what they can report in the moment. And then we, you know, we know that there's obviously lots of things that are going on underneath that they may not yet be aware of. Um, how do you, how do you tackle that in the group? How, how does that go that looks different potentially to individual therapy? I mean, do you, do you have people in the group that just say, like you know there's no feelings there or I can't I can't think of a time when I really felt angry or or they they locate um a particular time and are sort of applying the wrong feeling if we call it that I'm thinking about guilt too like I'm wondering I'm wondering how that comes up how you get to that in a group format um yeah all of all of that if there's anything in there that you want to pick up on yes I mean I definitely think there's a lot of conscious resistance, as I've mentioned, and um, there's a lot of unconscious resistance as yeah. well when we start these these groups. Oh, I can't think of anything. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I, that doesn't that's not an issue for me. Mm. Oh, I don't I don't have any feelings. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a it, it comes up just like it does in the individual therapy. And we have all of the techniques um, that we use in ISTDP okay. that we try to implement. Um, okay. At the same time, we have the group, like I said. And so I refer to it, you know, colloquially as getting over the hump. And in the group, I okay. feel like there is a group resistance yeah. that, that manifests yes. and they feed off of each other at the beginning. And if we can get one person to jump off the cliff mm. figuratively and do it and then bring everybody on, the whole resistance of the group can drop. Wow. And and suddenly everybody is on board mm. and then people are thinking of things and then, oh, yeah, oh, me too. Oh, yeah, I, I have that happen. So, so I and I think that realistically with my patient population and talking to others, I know they have different patient populations and it goes differently, but it tends to be three or four sessions okay. where we are dipping our toe in and then back, you know, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And then about set on the average group session, three or four, someone will go through the process. We will have finally a view of the unconscious, wow. it'll all come together. Okay. And hopefully that changes the mm -hmm. whole, um, the whole flow of the, of the sessions from there on out. 
And then everybody will be peer pressuring each other to get their pain scores lower. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, what's your pain score? Well, I don't want. So, well, I'm a zero today. Oh. And so, so the whole thing shifts when we get over the hump. But I think that that corresponds to mm. finally breaking down that resistance and opening up the unconscious for at least one of the patients. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's truly fascinating. It's almost like um, a reverse whirlpool is what I'm hearing. Like rather than like it's sucking, hopefully it's <laughs> empowering going up, but there's like a sense that, yeah, kind of the momentum of one person almost like pulls in the others. And I can see how, um, I can see how that might even be more potent than individual therapy. Like you say, at least for, for particular people that, um, yeah. that might otherwise be resistant in a room. Right. Um, right. Doing one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, yeah, for some of some people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm aware of time. Um, can I ask one more question? Is it sure. Time for one more. Um, I'm thinking about um sort of complex mixed feelings. And again, if we go back to um, emotional literacy at large, I think that's like a concept or an idea that's really not spoken about. There's something about um there's something about this happening in a group format that I imagine for many people being able to watch another person doing this in front of them. And it does go back to an earlier point. Um, so even though they're not the person who's actively going through the example with you in the group, they're just watching another person do it. There's something about being in that bystander position um, where it doesn't feel so personal that I think might allow it to seep in more, if that makes sense, or might then allow a person to go, oh, oh, this might relate to me. Maybe this is what, yeah. outside of that more confrontational um, approach. And I think for certain people, that may be what is so powerful about what's going on. It's almost like, and this came up in the conversation I had with um, with John Viveki and, and Terry Dentry about chronic pain. Um, it's almost like watching theater, like almost seeing your internal conflict externalized and seeing someone else sort of wrestling with it perhaps if we talk about it that way, you know, with you, um, just seeing it happen in front of them that might, might allow it to act on them in some particular way that I think could be very powerful. Um, yes. What do you think about that idea from your experience? Because you've actually run these groups. Does that feel like it has legs? Yes, I, I do think, yeah, I do think I know what you're talking about because it's it's almost like what I'm hearing is that they're struck on an unconscious level. I mean, yes. they may not be like consciously mm -hmm. identifying, but there there's something that's being tapped in on an unconscious level. And that's why I, I think we've noticed these sessions where one person gets unlocked and the rest of the group is is unlocked. So mm -hmm. it is like it seeps in yeah. somehow, like you said, to their unconscious you know, when, when everything goes well, mm. I mean, and it doesn't always in, in reality, but, mm. but that's ideally, I think what, what we are going for. In it's the like, group. A, it's like a group UTA. Yes. It's, yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. Have you, um, have you written, have you written up much? Um, Cause I know obviously you're doing trials, so I understand very rigorous sort of quantitative outcomes, but have you written up much around just sort of your more of your qualitative experience of running these groups and um, what it is that you're seeing that maybe isn't so so well captured or capturable in quantitative data, especially the rigorous kind that's required for a trial. Um, because I know when you're going through the design phase for these sorts of things is you, you have to think about what's going to be, how are we going to tell the story, what's going to be the kinds of measures that are most um, accepted by people. So you're, you're discarding a lot of other measures you might otherwise choose. Um, I'm wondering if there's ever been space for you to, yeah, to think about this more in terms of, yeah, like what the the the, the experiences you're having and um, maybe the um, inklings you're having about what exactly is going on here that falls outside of what maybe the numbers would capture. Have you ever written anything up like that? No, I haven't. Uh, mostly, I mean, not not for lack of interest, but mm -hmm. but for lack of time. But yeah, I bet. I mean, I would love to collaborate with you on that. Yeah, 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 I'd love to. Qualitative research, because mm -hmm. I do think it's so important. I have reflected on it a lot. And it's mostly if I'm giving a talk or an, on, and it's supposed to be on group, you know, a more clinical audience and discussions like these, 
then it it comes up that I'm able to share some of my thoughts mm-hmm. um, about what I really think is going on, you know, behind the scenes and the operation of the group. But no, I haven't I haven't written anything up on it yet. I mean, there was one paper I worked on with a psychology intern where we went a little more in depth, but it was primarily about the telehealth. Uh, um, yeah. The first art author is Lauren Alquist. Mm-hmm. Um, if anybody wants to look that up, it goes into a little more depth. There are transcripts. It's more like a oh, an ISTDP no. article that that people be, would be familiar with. Okay. Um, okay. But yeah, I would love to look more at that. I would love to write something with you one day. Um, if you're interested, Brandon. Um, and and if not me, I would um I would just really encourage you to because um. I, I just think that that's where so much of the gold is like your experience running so many of these groups now and, and, and going through this whole research pro- process over and over. Um, there is so much, there is so much wisdom you would have from that, um, that I think is, is equally important to obviously the, the numbers and the graphs, which we do need. Um, of, of course, course. of course. Yeah. 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 Um, I won't keep you any longer. Uh, I've loved this. I could talk to you for hours. Um, yeah. Yeah, I really, really sure. appreciate it. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for inviting me. Of yeah, it's course. been fun talking to you. Where can um where can people find your work? Do you have do you have a website you, you like to point people to or where can people find um, you? I, I do have a very small YouTube channel myself. Yes. Um so yeah, it's in in uh it's it's like yours. It's just uh, me and um talking about about my interests and things. And so people could check that out. It's just at Brandon Yarns M D. Mm-hmm. Um but but yeah, I don't have a website or anything. People are happy to Google my my UCLA profile. It's got my publications listed there. Amazing. I will um I'll leave a link to your YouTube channel as well. That would be fantastic. Oh, thank you. Um and I would love to talk another time. I, I have all these other questions too around moral injury and working with veterans and oh, yes. and guilt yes. and and all these all these things. Um, but I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you.